Welcome you back to our study in the book of Micah the prophet. We will be continuing this study in chapter 2, looking at the words that the prophet Micah gave to the house of Israel. This was before Tilgath Pileser the third from Assyria came in and, and conquered the, the northern kingdom. It's also before Nebuchadnezzar came in uh, with Babylon and conquered the southern kingdom. So what Micah's setting up here is really a prophecy that is important for both the northern and the southern kingdom. For those who listen, there is a positive answer that's God, that God's giving to them. However, for those that do not listen, uh, there's destruction on the way. At the moment that Malachi's giving, or Micah, sorry, is giving this prophecy, uh, it's every, every bit possible that Assyria was already marching or preparing their armies to march on the 10 northern tribes. We know that that, uh, that invasion came in several parts, uh, with the last one coming with Sennacherib, who came in, um, but that eventually because of Hezekiah, who was king in Jerusalem at the time, he went before God, humbled himself, prayed, and asked for God's deliverance. Uh, the southern kingdom, for the most part, was preserved by God for about a hundred years before Nebuchadnezzar came in. So the, the words of Micah the prophet, one man uh, that we have an account of, was of great value to the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom didn't pay uh, heed and they were destroyed by Assyria and in chapter 2 as we're reading we're going to see some of the reason why God came against his people and if this sounds at all similar to things today it's because we're living in a period very similar this is the purpose of reading Micah the prophet uh, not just to know the prophecies of the minor prophets but to be able to see and compare and correlate what they said for a people that were on the brink of destruction with us today and where we may or may not be in our course for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and get into it. Chapter 2 of Micah, verses 1 and 2. It says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it's in the power of their hands. And they covet fields, and they take them by violence, and houses, and they take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Really important as we're looking at this. Uh, it appears predominantly by the text, just reading it, the, the verbiage, the, the feeling that's coming across, that you have an oppressive people that are oppressing all of God's people. We oftentimes learn to imitate those above us. So obviously if our governors, whoever they may be, are oppressing us, we are likely to be oppressing those under us. That doesn't make it right, but oftentimes this is the case. We can see some images over on the right-hand side. All these people are important, and I think they all play into the story that Micah is unfolding. He's playing in, he, he's speaking of an era when there were several things happening that today we can see happening also. Uh, first picture on the bottom, the bankers, the banking system was taking advantage of the people. More than anything, it's, they, they have learned to play with money in such a way so they never lose, but the poorest of the poor always lose. And so it's easy when you have uh, 100,000 people, a million people, 7 million people who are maybe losing pennies, but you as an institution no longer losing anything. And this is what the banking industry learned to do back then. It's what they've learned to do today to preserve their own interests and not the interests of the people. Second image up from that, we see a bunch of men in a, in a government office building sitting around making laws. Again, we have this picture as we're going to read through here of the government people who are also learning how to play the system. They were getting voted in whether on one side or whether on the other side. It didn't really matter who was put into power. They were destroying the nation. They were destroying God's people. Maybe some of them faster, maybe some of them slower. 
But the inevitable outcome was always the same. Oftentimes when it comes to election time, you'll hear people saying, well, I'm voting for the worst of two evils or the better of two evils. I'm sorry, I'm mistaken there. The better of two evils. The, the reality of it is if you're voting for the better of two evils, you're still voting for an evil and it's still a decline and it's still a destruction. And so why vote for evil at all? Oftentimes uh, the rebuttal to that is, well, if I don't vote for someone, who, who am I going to vote for? Well, there's a point in here where the people have to stop and say, look, we can't keep supporting what's happening because it's all wrong. If we keep voting for the better of two evils, we never advance. We just keep sliding, thinking that maybe we're doing some good and maybe, maybe there's one or two good people that are voted in during that period of time. But the overall direction is still wrong. The people have to stand up and say, stop the system. We're not going to continue this. Neither side is taking us in the right direction. We're stopping entirely until we can figure out how to fix the system. This is necessary. And if we don't do it, well, we're just, we're, we're, we may prolong our time, but the inevitable still comes. Up in the top right, you have uh, a third image, uh, famous preachers. And it's easy enough. Uh, there's probably dozens of images I could have put in there. I didn't grab this one in particular because of who's on there or anything. Just a Google search, who are some of the richest pastors in the world, most popular, etc. Why? Because we're going to see that this plays in also in the story that Mike is giving. The prophets, the ministry, the preachers, God's servants were playing the system. They were playing the system for their own benefit. They were not benefiting the people of God. And that doesn't mean that they were all doing just evil. They may have been teaching some things good. Even today, many uh, pastors in many churches teach good things. But overall, they were gaming the system, it's called. They were using the system for their own benefit and their own advancement, not the advancement of the kingdom. And that's sad. And the last image in the top right, of course, you have your gangs. You have your powerhouses in this world, whether, whether we look at them as gangs, whether we look at, at them as narco families, whether we look at them as whatever, these powerhouses of people that are out there just doing evil, whether it's because they're selling drugs or trafficking humans or whatever it is, they're out there. They have a power. And in some nations, they have extraordinary strong power. And they can actually govern entire areas of country just because these are the guys that got the guns and the power. So these are the people who are coveting fields. They're taking by violence. They're taking God's people's possessions away from them. They're oppressing a man in his household. And so this is pretty important. When we look at that phrase, they oppress a man in his household. The word man in this verse is geber. The word geber in Hebrew often refers not just to a man, but an upright, strong, or valiant man. So they're not just oppressing just anyone. Most specifically, they're oppressing good people. They're oppressing good people by their bad actions, by their bad words, by their bad examples. They're oppressing good people just by what they do. The oppression or taking by violence that is spoken of here implies the use of laws fraudulently. And so they're actually using the rules, they're using laws, they're using what they've put in place, but they're using them fraudulently to oppress people. And this is what is specifically talking in this passage. So they're oppressing the righteous and the upright through the use of fraudulent laws and laws used fraudulently, two different things. And this is what they're doing. And they're, they're tearing down God's people inevitably and destruction comes. Unfortunately, as this tearing down happens, which usually isn't extraordinarily fast, although historically it's a lot faster than we think, uh, the problem in here is that our children grow up sometimes, one generation, maybe even two generations, seeing what these people, who oftentimes say they're actually believers, 
are doing, whether or not they're the financiers who say that they're believers, whether or not they're politicians who say they're believers, whether or not they're pastors who are coming out in the name of God. It doesn't really matter. Even in the gangs and, and of course, specifically, if we take a separate branch of gangs that we don't often think about, Hollywood and those types, which are a type of gang. Uh, oftentimes you'll see them, they're wearing Christian imagery, crosses, whatever, talking about God. But overall, their lives are bad and wrong and bad examples. Our young kids see these people speaking about God and saying, well, if they're speaking about God, if they are Christian, then I, who am not nearly as bad as they, am practically a saint. And so we begin having these people in the world who are by far not good examples being role models for our children. And how do we stop it? With where television is, where Hollywood is, where social media is, it's almost impossible, uh, the music industry, it's almost impossible to keep these people out of the eyes of our children. So these become the role models, the people that they're looking up to, and many of them, appear to be, in some simil, small way, believers. And this is the danger of it. So let's continue. How do we have a good, strong family? I think this is important because as we're looking at the tearing down of things, it's important for us to ask some questions about our family because everything starts at home. Uh, we can look at the government, we can look at politicians, we can look at the financiers, etc. And we can always point fingers outside of us. But inevitably, where did those people come from? Where did, you know, I, it doesn't really matter who you pick out of uh, the current political spectrum. Take your choice. Uh, whoever is the greatest evil uh, in your perspective, whether it's politically or otherwise. Who are these, uh, the enemies of the people? Well, just stop and think for a moment. They came from somewhere. They came from a family. They came from a mother and a father. Maybe they didn't have the same kind of family of what you would term a family, but they came from a family. They were born, they were raised, they had uncles and aunts and grandparents, most likely, maybe cousins and, and whatnot. And so, we need to bring it back to the family because if we're going to change the world, it starts at home. So some simple questions here, six of them in particular, just for us to think about as we're reading through this and considering how we might change the world. Number one, is there ample humor and fun within your family despite the real demands of daily life? In other words, are you interacting with your kids in a good and positive way? Are you being a distinct example for them that's very different from what the world is offering them? Number two, does your family have rules that have been clearly stated and are even applied, yet are flexible and respond to new situations and changes in the family? So, oftentimes when we start looking outside of a good Christian family, uh, rules are not a big thing. In fact, you'll find that there are actually people in this world that believe it's a sin to tell a child no or to discipline a child. Uh, God tells us that we need to have rules. There needs to be real rules. They need to be applied. They, there, needs to be, there needs to be a system that your kids as they're growing up can have expectations in and can know works and is just. This starts with the mother and the father and then the grandparents. Uh, you can't have grandparents coming in and destroying the family system, not if we want our future to be a better one. Number three, are families' expectations of each other's, of each person reasonable, realistic, mutually agreed upon, and generally fulfilled? And I think this is pretty important because I do believe there is a balance in a family. I think that we should not expect more of our family than is really possible. Sometimes we do have unreasonable expectations. And that's where we need to just sit back, look at the Word of God, look at many examples that are in the Word of God, and say, see, what is reasonable? What is reasonable to expect out of our children at different ages as they grow? What is reasonable to expect out of ourselves as parents? Uh, these should be realistic, and we should always be growing. 
Uh, that's one of the most important things. We should never be stagnant because wherever we are, we're not perfect. And that doesn't matter where we are. <coughs> we may be better than, you know, the Joe next door, so to speak. But the reality is we're not perfect. So wherever we are, take, a, take an overview of your life, your family, and understand that where you are, it's kind of like, you know, when, when you take your little kids and they're growing and you take them over to the doorway and on the doorway you draw lines and you're measuring their growth, you know, they're three foot tall, they're four foot tall, etc. And you're drawing these lines on the doorway so that you can remember the growth. This is what we need to do about our family experience. We need to have symbolically this line drawn in the doorway. This is where we are today. Where would we like to go? What would bring us closer to being the true kingdom of God here on earth? Number four, do family members achieve most of their individual goals and are their personal needs being met? We need to be considerate of one another. Uh, the second law in God's two great laws are love your neighbor as yourself. This is important because it's speaking externally of yourself. It's not talking about being a narcissist or being, you know, arrogant and only think about what you want or what your needs are. It's thinking about the good of all who are here. We want the whole to go on together, not just me to get to an end. And so this is important to think of the family as a whole. And we want everything to be, you know, to move forward towards God's kingdom. Number five, do parents and children have genuine respect for one another, demonstrating love, care, caring, trust, and concern, even when there are disagreements? How do you deal with disagreements in your family? Uh, do, you, do you just lash out at your kids? Do you just yell? Do you just, I mean, what is it that you do? Is what you do, what you imagine is ideal in God's kingdom. Would you do what you do in front of God if he was standing there with you? And I think these are important questions for us to look at. I can't tell you what's best for your family because I don't know your family, but what I can give you is ideals. So God calls us up to be genuine, to have respect for one another, to demonstrate love, outward affection, this means saying, I love you. This means giving appropriate hugs and uh, that love that is external of us. It means caring for others in our actions and in our words. It means giving trust and being trustworthy. It means being concerned, real concerned, not just casually asking your kids, you know, how was your day at work? And they say, oh, it was okay. Oh, okay. That's great. No, that's not real concern. Sometimes we need to really get into it and we need to think about it. And I myself have failed in this uh, in some regards in my life. And so when I speak, I'm speaking of things that I've seen myself raising my children. Number six, is your family able to mature and change without everyone getting upset or unhappy? Remember, just as you measure your child's growth on the doorpost, what you're actually showing them is there is a growth that is normal, it's okay, and it's to be expected. This should exist in our family life too. We should know we are not at the best spot. We may not be at a very good spot at all. But we are attempting to grow. There will be changes. This is natural. This is normal. Everyone grows, hopefully, in a positive direction. Some don't by choice, but we want everyone to grow in a positive direction. And this shouldn't be a surprise or it shouldn't be something that uh, dis is distraughtful to us because we're growing. Just pay attention and allow God to do His will. So let's go back on into Micah. We're in chapter 2, verses 3 uh, and 4. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, Woe be utterly spoiled, we be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Of course, God is speaking towards uh, the, the 12 tribes, predominantly focusing on the 10 northern kingdom tribes, first and foremost. Um, but the idea here is that God is coming and he's devising evil. Why? Because we have been, uh, we have been evil in our hearts. 
And so we know until Gath Pilisar the third came in and took the ten northern tribes, uh, he carried the people away. And there's one of the prophetic uh, passages in the Bible talks about them marching naked before their enemies. And I don't know that it literally means they were naked, but the idea is they were embarrassed about who and what was happening, and they were taken openly before, before their enemies. Uh, the same enemies that they had probably many times said, God will save us too. But God did not save them. Why? Because they were being evil. So I've got some pictures here, and these are some interesting pictures. Uh, we have a picture in the upper left and in the lower right. These are the same groups of people. This is a pastor. Uh, came out in the news not too long ago. Uh, this pastor, uh, a thief, that's the very middle, the guy in uh, all black with a hoodie over his head. He came into the church Sunday morning where the pastor was and robbed him of his jewelry worth over $400,000. Now, I have to ask an important question. What minister should be preaching with $400,000 worth of jewelry on his body? Okay, this is oppression of God's people. This is the oppression of all uh, that is good and right. And so we can see in the bottom left um, these people that look like they're in an oppressed state. They've got chains on them. They are being oppressed by the people who have chosen not to care about them. If you think about the world today, you know, a lot of people complain about child trafficking, about racism, about slavery, and about many different things that have happened in the history of the West. Uh, but how many people do you see actually holding to task those countries that still practice slavery. These people, they've come out of this past and think that they deserve now to stand from a pulpit, preach the word of God with $400,000 worth of jewelry on them. This is not at all what God's idea of righteous is. And this is why God's people were spoiled because this is where they were. Even in the Old Testament time, Perhaps they didn't have 400,000 in jewelry on them, but I'm sure they had the equivalent sum because this was the purpose and this is what God was talking about. It's an evil time. God devised evil against them because these were evil people. These were evil people. So <clears throat> when it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise evil. The word family there is really important in this context. It's important because it's not talking about a family as far as the nuclear family, mother, father, child, son, daughters, etc. The word family here in the Hebrew is mich pacha and implies family in the sense of a gang or a group of people who are working together for a purpose but that they are not necessarily related by blood. God often uses a poetic justice, you reap what you sow. And so when God says he's coming against the family, he's talking about this group of people working together to devise evil against God's people. And again, that goes back to the first picture, the, the financiers, the politicians, uh, the religious leaders, and also, you know, gangs uh, in general. These are the people God's coming against because they are oppressing God's people. The biggest problem isn't really the oppression, because throughout all times, sometimes God's people have been oppressed. The most important thing here is the example and what this is showing children, because to come out as a pastor and $400,000 in jewelry is to tell people that you are something special. You are somehow deserving. You are... Uh, well, it's, it's exact opposite of what Jesus Christ himself came and showed. And this is important. This is why God thinks of it as an abomination. Let's continue in verse 5 through 7. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. Prophesy ye not. <laughs> Say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. O Thou that are named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? 
Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? And, and this is such powerful words because, of course, God's coming and he's talking to his people who are about to be destroyed because of their evil hearts. This is important. So, verse 5 is kind of an odd statement. Therefore thou shalt have none that cast the cord or lot in the congregation of the Lord. And what this is implying, it's implying a justice system. You have a judge, you have... Uh, a crowd of people, someone has been accused of evil. And so the judge asks of the crowd of people, is there anyone who will stand as a positive character witness for this person? And this is what it's talking about. It says no one will stand. So the idea of casting a cord by lot in the congregation was when the judge asked this question, you could throw down, <clears throat> you could throw down your cord, basically telling the judge, I'm willing to stand in testimony for them, in favor of them as good people. And so God's saying, no one's going to do this. No one's going to stand for you. Why? Because it's pretty obvious anyone who was standing for you would really be lying because you are evil. And so God says in 6, don't prophesy to them. Don't tell them what's about to come because they will not listen. Verse 7, God asks them in a very simple way, uh, you are called the house of Jacob. You are called the people of God. Uh, have, you, have you missed something? Is there, have I not done all I can for you? Is not the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Is, isn't God's way one path that's straight and narrow? Uh, do I not say, you know, if you repent, I'll forgive you? Are not my words to him that walketh uprightly good? God's asking these questions and the people are embarrassed. The people are embarrassed not because what God's saying is true, but because in their hearts they really want to do what's evil. They are an evil people. And so God's coming and asking these things, come to me. And the people are saying, you know, no, not really, not really. I don't want to. Uh, maybe they go to the temple. Maybe they bring in their offerings, but their, their heart's not there. Their heart every day is in the world and the things of the world. This is where they want to go. And this is important to bring out. Let's continue in verse 8 through 10. Even of late, my people has risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses, for their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest, because it is polluted and shall destroy you even with a sword destruction. So God's coming out and he's giving us a distinction. There's two roles here. You've chosen the low road. So the high road was being warriors, being men, being men of God, following the commandments, having a nuclear family, one man, one wife, his family, his kids, getting married appropriately, setting good example. This was the good thing. This is what God expected. The people set that aside. And so when it says in verse 8, of late my people has risen up as an enemy, inside of their own people was the enemy. They were their own enemy, their choices, their actions. So essentially what, what's going on here, you have a good person walking down the road, doing what's good and right, and he's being called out for doing what's good and right. This is verse 8. You're pulling off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely. Someone's doing something right, you're stopping them, and you're abusing them for doing what's right. Verse 9, the women I, my people have cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children have you taken away my glory forever. And so there was an established, what we would might call norm for a family. There was a role for the woman. There was roles for the children. There's a role for the man. Uh, these people have cast it all out. So typically you had a man, his wife, his children raised up in an environment of the family. So what have they done? They've cast out the woman. And you can see this in the image of the lower two images here. You have a man married to a man with a child they've adopted. They've cast out the role of the woman. You have on the left-hand side uh, a man who in every way looks like a woman, except obviously for the beard because most women can't have that kind of a beard. 
And so the idea here is they're destroying the glory of God. They're destroying what it means to be a woman. Obviously, they're destroying what it means to be a real man. They're taking away the, the children, the glory of the children, because those who suffer, I mean, you consider two men or two women who get married, technically they can never have offspring. And of course, if a person transitions from a man to a woman through medical uh, operations or vice versa, they are, they're destroyed forever from being able to have children. And so the suffering is in the glory of the children. God has over and over again spoken of in scripture, the glory of the family, the glory is in the children. Uh, as an archer who has you know, many shafts of arrow uh, on his back for, his, uh, for the war. Uh, this is the way God's depicted the family. To God, it's a wonderful blessing to have many kids. They're destroying this. They're wiping it out. They're taking away that glory because it points to God. And we see this today. Uh, over and over again, people are destroying what is in God's eyes, an appropriate family structure. And this is what it says in verse 10. If we do this, what will happen? It will destroy us with a sword destruction. Happened over and over again throughout history. Every culture that destroyed what it is to be a good godly family, the culture itself was destroyed. Again, this doesn't have so much to do about whether or not someone has a different idea of what's fun or, or enjoyable to them, so to speak, or ideal to them. What this has to do is, is the nation as a whole. When these things are permitted, the nation will be destroyed, not just the individual families. Uh, and this is important to think about because every nation that practiced this was eventually destroyed. And this will continue to the end of time. That's just the way it is. Verses 11 through 13. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah, as the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The, bre the breaker has come up before them. They have broken up. They have passed through the gate. They are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. And so it's speaking here of the character of the people. If someone comes and prophesies false prophecy, if someone comes and tells them, all's well in Zion, all's going to turn out well. Don't you worry about a thing. Uh, everything's in God's hands. He knows where we're going. We're going to the kingdom. So just take it easy and ride the fast train to the kingdom. It says, if someone comes and prophesies wonderful prophecies, the people accept them. This is the prophet of God. But if the prophet come out and say, woe unto us, we are doing evil. We're oppressing the widows, we're oppressing the orphans, we're oppressing the stranger who is in our midst, we're oppressing the, the true priesthood of God, we're not following God's commandments, we are uh, in many ways abhorring all that is good and right. This is the people that, this is the, the prophet that the people will abhor. They will throw them out, they'll cast them out, they'll cast stones at them if possible. They don't want to hear it. They want to hear the pleasant words of how wonderful we are. We are the people of God. And so God says, what's going to happen? 12 and 13, you guys are going to be marched out, single file, out of town, before your enemies, and everyone's going to see it. Uh, in our images on the right, we have several archaeological pieces that have been found over the years. Upper right is a tablet from Tilgath Pilisar III, speaking of his conquests in Israel. Next is this column from Sennacherib, and it also speaks of his conquests into uh, Israel. We have this mural, this carved mural. This guy who is kneeling on the ground is supposed to be Jehu. Uh, the king of the north. And so what did it say in 13? It says, you will all go marching at the head the king will pass before. They were all taken by the Assyrians, the 10 tribes of the north, taken. And 
Those that were not killed were taken prisoner as slaves, as servants, and spread across all of the Assyrian Empire, and then even farther than that as time progressed. God prophesied it would happen. The people did not listen. It did happen. It was fulfilled. And from that point till now, the ten kingdoms of the northern tribes uh, have been destroyed and in a big sense don't exist as their individual units anymore. That doesn't mean that those people and their descendants are all gone. They blended in with other cultures. They become part of the genetic makeup of other cultures. Um, will we ever be able to define them again or single them out again by their tribes? Most likely not because likely their genetics are well mixed in with other people's. But they are out there still. Uh, in some small part, but until they co come back and recognize God and their errors, it doesn't really matter who they are anyway, because God accepts none that are not repentant and humbled. And this is what it's talking about. So, you know, we think about this verse uh, 11 about a man walking, uh, prophesying, but prophesying the pleasant things of life. I'd like to read a small passage here in Ezekiel chapter 13, starting in verses 1 through 7. And it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say, Thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made ye up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, The Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision? Have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. So Ezekiel comes and he prophesies to the people and he tells them, look, this is what God's saying. All these prophets over here you've been listening to, all these ones who have been telling you platitudes and wonderful things about how everything's going to go right, God didn't send them. They've been prophesying out of their own heart. And if you just wait a moment or two, you will find out that it's true because God does not lie. And this is what happened. Ezekiel, Micah, all of them uh, were proven true prophets of God because what God gave them to prophesy came to pass. Uh, the ten tribes were taken away in captivity, uh, and that was the end of the ten tribes, uh, the northern kingdom more than anything. And so when we hear the beautiful prophecies, the platitudes that make it sound like all is well in Zion, uh, be cautious. That may not be God's prophet speaking. It doesn't necessarily always mean it's not God's prophet speaking, but be extraordinarily cautious. Uh, those that are telling you and warning you to prepare because there is consequences coming for our misdeeds, these are probably more likely to be listening to the Spirit of God. Pay probably better attention to them uh, and what they're saying. Doesn't always mean they're from God, but uh, they're far more likely to be from God if they're warning you to repent uh, and pay attention to your life. So this is the second chapter of Micah. Hope it helps a little bit. We're going to continue uh, again later on in chapter 3. Hope this uh, blesses your day. Take care and God bless.